Welcome, everybody, to the latest edition of the Half Court Press podcast. I am sitting next to Joel Lorenzi, Creighton basketball beat writer for the Omaha World Herald. I am Dirk Chatwin. I don't really have a role around here, but I uh, try to pay attention you to man, things. Bro, you him. <laughs> uh, we have a, a full podcast to get to. A couple of very interesting games here in the last uh, 48 hours. Creighton uh, going on the road and beating Butler with ease. Uh, Nebraska beating Ohio State in Lincoln with less, less ease, ease yeah. but but probably an even greater sense of urgency uh, considering the challenges facing that program right now. Uh, just really two solid wins, Joel, and, and I think you know you're going to hear coaches say anytime you can get a win in the, a road win in the Big East, uh, you'll take it. Creighton looked pretty good in the second half, especially. Uh, what did you What did you come away with from from Hinkle Fieldhouse? Yeah, and speaking of road wins, I think it's especially been hard in, in recent years to beat Butler at Hinkle, and so you look at it. Obviously, this Butler team is probably uncharacteristic uh compared to recent years but uh they're not the pushovers most people think they are i mean they beat granted k-state wasn't k-state the k-state we know when they beat them but butler got a win over k-state that's all their only loss yeah and so um so yeah obviously like you mentioned in the second half they were dominant and um kalkbrenner ryan kalkbrenner means everything to this team um i think the Bulldogs shot 27% on twos, which is insane because they, they they shot, like, over 40% from three. Like, a, the kind of game they had shooting from deep would usually win you a game if they weren't abysmal inside the arc. And that's because of the big guy, man. Um, people had people obviously criticized him earlier in the year. Um, we don't know how long he was sick, whatever. Um, but one-on-one matchups with big men, um, he just wasn't great. He, he was – you know, outmatched in, in some games. And, you know, since then, he's really turned the corner. Um, healthy him has altered shots like probably never before. I mean, he's having a, a defensive stretch that's arguably his, his best of his career. So, No, I thought uh, I thought Creighton looked, you know, really solid. Uh, they look like they've kind of found their footing again. Uh, we'll get to we'll get to back to them in a second. The the other big uh, big result here was was Nebraska just finding a way to beat Ohio State. Ohio State's a little bit in shambles, uh, but considering there wasn't much environment in Lincoln last night, considering Jawan Gary's out for the year, uh, considering Nebraska was coming off a a, a butt kicking at Purdue, that was that was a critical game for the Huskers, and they just kind of found a way. Um, it was a it was an ugly game. It was a Doc Sadler, you know, special, Barry Collier special, and yet Nebraska made some really critical plays down the stretch. Uh, I was I was super impressed because that's a game that, you know, we've seen Nebraska lose that game many, many times in the past. Uh, Joel, there are certain games on a schedule, and granted we tend to make too big a deal out of each single one for Nebraska because we don't know how many they're going to win, but that there are certain games on a schedule where you point to and you just say, uh, that was a critical one. They they had to they had to grab it. It was sort of a turning point. They got huge uh, huge contributions uh, from Tominaga, from Dawson, uh, from a few offensive sources there that that you don't necessarily count on. Derek Walker wasn't great. Um, like I said, without Jawan Gary, they're going to have to find it from somewhere else. And they just kind of locked down defensively. They they rallied to win that game. Ohio State maybe isn't the Ohio State we saw a month ago, but uh, still a really good win, Joel. Yeah, still a good win, and um, they pulled it out down the stretch, man. Like I, I only saw glimpses of that game, but I know that there was a really, really rough call, probably some, uh, a few rough calls yeah. down the stretch of that game. There was a Tominaga, there was a foul on Tominaga that would have gone down in Husker infamy had Nebraska lost it. Yeah, so to pull that out after that, and uh, especially after we've challenged uh, Hoiberg's at get more than one big win after Creighton, and he's pulled out a few. So, Yeah, and, and Hoiberg was kind of the story last night because he, he got a technical foul. His mm-hmm. first one as Nebraska's coach, uh, he, he sort of got a sense. I think he's kind of got a sense that they are, you know, they're going to have to – to make the most of this situation, losing Gary is just just really hurts. I mean, he's 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 such a um, 
such a jack of all trades type of guy. I mean, he can just he's so athletic, so intense, uh so good defensively. <clears throat> to lose him for the year is is just a a heavy heavy blow uh for Nebraska to to find ways to win games is going to be harder than ever and and Fred I think got a sense of that last night especially in the second half that that they needed a little bit of a lift and so he uh he fell on the sword uh got a technical foul and and as the guys said it it lifted them it lifted them it lifted the energy in the building and certainly lifted the morale of his team so uh Fred Hoiberg's fighting even as his players are fighting too yeah, no doubt, and and I was I was surprised to see that, that 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 was his first tech of his career. I mean, obviously he he's probably not the type to to get techs, but first tech in in all his years as the Brassers coach, that's that's a wild stat. It is. Uh, you know, there was a year there where you know they were playing in, in empty arenas, and so officials can hear everything a coach said. Uh, so you know, you'd think he might get one that year just because because officials could hear everything, but. Uh, yeah, this is not exactly Fran McCaffrey in Lincoln, Nebraska. So, sure. and I, I saw the shooting splits before and after. That. I think Amy posted yep. the shooting splits before. They were and making after. shots. So really magical stuff. Uh, a good coach knows when to push every button. Sure. I got five big questions today, Joel, uh, and then we'll get out of here. So, the five big questions. Let's start with this one. Can Creighton still win the Big East Conference? Yeah. And so, um, wait, does that yeah no, mean no, no, mean I'm, like yeah, like I'm starting to answer your question. Okay, okay, I, I'm not ruling it out. Um, oh come on, no, no, hear me out, hear me out. After yesterday, and I think this past week, the pathway is there. It I, is. I'm not sure it was. That's why we asked the question. I'm not sure it was ever gone. Um, I think if I think if Creighton never lost in Nebraska, we'd have a, such a different outlook on the season. But I think they needed that kick in the ass to even get to this point. Um, and so, forgetting all that happened before, um, looking now at the schedule ahead and seeing that all the tough road games are behind them, granted it came at um, a bad time for them because if they were probably spaced out, they might have had a, a better opportunity to win one or two of those and, and add to their resume because the top of the Big East looks really, really good these days. Um, but it, it, it happened in a way where they, they tumbled and um, – you know, now they got the chance to, you know, see some of these teams at home, um, stack up, you know, road wins against St. John's and um, a few of the other middle of the pack schools, uh, Seton Hall, who who just knocked off UConn yesterday. So um, these road opportunities that are left aren't as bad as we might think. Nope. But they're not, you know, UConn or, or Marquette now. I, I, I thought the Marquette game coming first for them. After you know, without Cog Brenner, after that that stretch was a really really bad time for them to play that game, and and there's there's no control over that. Um, and in retrospect, it it isn't a bad time to play that game because Marquette was picked ninth in the preseason poll, but they're damn good, man. Here's the flip side of the the Marquette thing because I think Creighton fans tend to look at that and say it was a bad break to play that game first, okay? Sure. With without Cog Brenner, but the flip side of that is if you play that game in Omaha. And you lose it, which they might have, considering how they were playing at the time. Yeah. Then, then you fumbled away a home game, right? Sure. And, and you might go up to Milwaukee and, and lose to them in February, uh, even at full strength. So I think, in hindsight, you know, you look at it and you say, well, we might have lost that game anyway. Um, and yes, it was the extension of a losing streak that was very damaging. But but Marquette's seven and two in the Big East right now. That's a tough place to win. Uh, I don't think that one is as regrettable in hindsight as we thought it was at the time. Uh, you mentioned the Xavier and and the Connecticut road losses. Um, you know, Xavier's even with the loss to DePaul last night. Xavier is still and that was relatively fluky. That was it's just that was East, very fluky. Big East fashion. You yeah. should not lose that DePaul. I th- I thought the last possession. Um, I typically like that draw where you come from the sideline and toss it to the – like I've seen that run, ran before where you toss it to a guy who can get up and catch it on the other block and, and make something happen. But they do it to Jack Nungy. Like Jack Nungy probably can't get up higher than Jokic can. <laughs> and so I, I was super confused by that. And you saw the, the ensuing, the, you know, the aftermath. So, Joel, the, the UConn's free fall, it, it, we didn't think they were as good as they were on paper – at the end of December. 
Yeah. But did you see this coming? Oh my gosh! No. I mean, they're they're four and five and, in the Big East, and this is why the Big East is so open to me, and why the pathway for Creighton is there because you look at the rest of the way for Creighton, it's all home games against good teams, which they've protected home court for the most part, except the Nebraska game, um, and the away games are like winnable road games, and so um, the pathway for them is there. You know, Xavier, who just took their first Big East loss yesterday. Um, still has to play, you know, Creighton on the road. Still has to play UConn on the road. Still has to play basically all of the top of the Big East on the road. Still, so think that they, tougher days are coming for them. And so you mentioned UConn. Um, no, I did not see this coming. Um, with you know, arguably, you know, Sonogo had a case for Player of the Year once upon a time in, in the league, especially when they were doing what they were doing. Now I, I'm not so sure of that. Um, and then with a guy like Klingon backing him up and just the depth they were boasting, um, you compared it uh, back then to to Creighton, who uh, only goes so deep, and it was like, damn, there's levels to this. And now UConn is just finding new ways to lose games um, every week. Um, I think they've lost four of their last five. So, And they've taken some, some brutal ones, man, like uh, St. John's. Um, if you are... In the conversation, because we weren't just talking about them as number one in the Big East. We were talking, some people were calling them number one in the country. Oh, absolutely. So, to take losses to Seton Hall and St. John's, obviously the league play is a different animal, but um, these are games, and in the fashion they're losing them, these are games you, you can't lose if you're uh, up there in the conversation for number one in the country. I think Marquette, I think you could make a case that Marquette's the favorite right now. I think so too. Um, you know, Creighton still has to go to Providence, but but you know, Creighton is better in Omaha. I think they're going to get even better in Omaha as the season progresses and the home crowds get better. Um, Villanova is not scary at all. It's just it's set up pretty well for Creighton. You know, if they can, let's say they split their road games, which I think is is very doable. Um, you know, maybe maybe even better than that. And then if you can, you know, if you can sweep at home, I think Creighton might be standing, you know, tied for first place at the end of the season. I mean, it's crazy how it's how it's sort of worked out that way. But for a le- for a team that's eleven and eight, is that the record? Eleven and eight mm-hmm. to to be a a conference championship contender at this point, I guess reflects a little bit of the uncertainty in the Big East. Uh, you know, reflects how weird that swoon was in December for Creighton. But yeah. is as ugly as they've been at so- at times, I think you can make a pretty good case that they're that they're right in the thick of this thing, and and honestly don't need that many breaks to make it happen. Yeah, and I think by now they know who they are. They don't go super deep. Um, their starters have to come with it. Um, when healthy, they do come with it. And so, um, like like dude, I didn't even notice. Uh, a lot of people were critical of Nemhard the past few weeks. I've been critical of him at times. Um, and then we come to find out that um, he was sick, too, in recent weeks and had an IV like the day of the Butler game and uh, just things like that. It, it seems like this team can't catch a break in terms of illnesses and whatnot. And so um, maybe we haven't seen this team fully healthy at one any given time. And so I think when they are – you know, fully healthy, whenever that may be, um, like completely healthy, not no hidden sickness or nothing like that. Um, but let's say they have been healthy the past week or so. I mean, like, let's say they were healthy that Butler game. They look damn good, man. And so um, the pathway's there. I, I, I do agree with you, though. I think Marquette is is probably the favorite only because, um, you know, with every team they match up against, they, they got one of the best half-court offenses in the country, not yep. just the league, the country. And so – I look at Creighton, who's, uh, you know, arguably the best defense in the league, at least up there, um, especially behind Kalkbrenner. And even still, it seems like Marquette always has answers for for stellar defenses, and they find new ways to to unlock their half-court offense. And and shout-out Shaka. Like, they're just – they get better every game, it seems, man. Like, I I, I was watching them just piece apart Providence. Like, Providence didn't stand – a chance last night so you're, you're probably right on that front that was a really good night of basketball in the big east it was, i mean man. good stuff you know that the yukon seton hall game was nuts um obviously you had the big upset there were just good matchups across the board yeah um second big question 
does Nebraska still have a chance of reaching the NIT? I don't know, man. And, and this one's probably directed, you know, more at me than you, but uh so, but Joel, they're ten and nine. They're they're gonna have one of the best schedule strengths in the country. Uh the Big Ten is gonna get nine or ten teams in the NCAA tournament. If Nebraska is eleventh in the pecking order at 16 and 15 or something like that. Do they stand a chance of making the NIT? Hmm. I think it'll take a couple good resume wins there. Like I know I I see this uh this Maryland game at home. I don't know if they could pull that out, but I think it would be huge for them. Um you so. start going down the list and you're like, you know, I mean, I know you you got the Ken Palm page up right now and it's like the, They've already played Purdue twice. They've yeah. already went to IU. Yeah. Um, you know, they've they've got tough road games, but but every home game feels winnable. Yeah. Um I don't know. I just, I don't know if they're well stocked enough, you know. It, you saw how hard they had to grind last night to win that game. Yeah. And to think that they're going to do it six or seven more times. Well, uh, Ohio State is better, I think, than some of the teams left for them like like you mentioned the home games go down the list of home games right so you got northwestern who has some good wins but i feel like that's a winnable game i mean you look down nebraska lost to northwestern last year on alumni day that wasn't pretty so (laughs) you go you go down the list and ken palm has them losing some of these home games by one point like that's that's what these games feel like yeah they're 50 50 yeah and so northwestern you have uh penn state which um, it's probably less winnable than Northwestern, but um, not completely out of the question. Yeah, you can always beat Penn State at home. That's just that's a law. Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin, Wisconsin's is so inconsistent. They're not playing very well. Yeah. Um, who else do we have here? We got Maryland, like I mentioned, which I think is nobody possible. nobody's scared of Maryland. Yeah, Minnesota. I don't I don't think I have to say much about Minnesota. I think Nebraska can beat Minnesota at home. Yeah, uh, Michigan State. Michigan State. You know that's. At least branding wise, that's a tougher one. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Michigan State is not vintage Michigan State for sure, and and that's the end of it. And so I think half of those games can at least be. I think they win half those games, and maybe you're only giving them half, huh? If it's only half, Joel, we can rule yet. out the NIT. You're right. You're I mean, right. they're going to have to go. So I mean, here's the, the formula I see is um, you go you go four and one at home. Sure. And you steal a road game somewhere, and then you win, you win one in in the conference tournament. And I think with the strength of schedule, with the strength of the Big Ten, maybe, 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 uh, that's enough to get you into the postseason. And that would be an enormous boost, a you know, enormous surprise for Nebraska this year. Um, if if Jawan Gary was there, Joel, I think I would, I think I would predict that it would happen. Um, I just don't think, you know, they're just, I'm afraid they're going to be running on fumes in some of these home games to the point where, uh, even if, even if they're playing against a flawed opponent, it's, it's, it's going to be tough for them to generate offense. It always comes back to offense, uh, with Nebraska. And so, you know, they, uh, they've just got to find a way to score. And, and last night it was, you know, it was Denim Dawson. Uh, somebody's going to have to, you know, surprise them with 10 points every night. And I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if that's a sustainable model. The margin for error is very small, but Hey man, they just beat Ohio state last night. Nobody thought they were going to, they were six point underdogs to Ohio state. So, right. uh, you get, like I said, you get some later, later into the year, you get some bigger crowds, uh, better crowds, you know, you sort of see the see the goal at the end of the line, and uh, and I think maybe they they can find a way. But uh, you can you can really tell that they're grinding right now. Like it is not easy for Nebraska right now. Yeah, no doubt. Third question, Joel: Does college basketball have a good team, a great team? I'm glad you asked me this. Um, <laughs> obviously, the discourse has been no. Right, there is no great team in college basketball. Um, the team I've been rocking with all year, people are going to argue against because... Houston, right? Yes, Houston, because they lost to Alabama. Rah, rah. I think if they played again, they would beat Alabama. And so, um, Houston, like, people don't... That's people's only argument against Houston. They, 
they're a great defense. Like, they're always a great defense, but they're an increasingly great defense this year. They got dudes, um, and they're just, I think, as a two-way team, probably the best team in the country. And and I look at, like, uh, like Kemp Palmer has, like, Tennessee and, like, UCLA as, like, this. But Houston's not team. playing anybody. So what, man? They play people in a – you know what's crazy? When, when Houston – play Virginia when Virginia was ranked number two, Houston dismembered Virginia. But Virginia is not the number two ranked team in the country. Now they're not because Houston exposed them, but people don't give them credit for stuff like that, man. They just brush it all. It's Houston or all. The the team they played wasn't that good. And that's why the... the, Man, I can't wait for them to be in the Big 12 because I think they're going to do the Big 12 dirty, frankly. And, And so... Um, I cannot wait to see the Big 12 basketball conference. Oh, my I, gosh. I, I, I mean, I nobody cares about Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, those are <laughs> – I'm sorry. They just don't. It's going to get so much better when you add, you know, Houston and, and Cincinnati and, um, you know, BYU and UCF. Uh, they're just a good basketball league. In my opinion, the best basketball league in the country is going to get even better. Yeah. Okay, but on, on the topic of great teams, I think that – if there is a great team, it has to be them for me. I mean, every team's lost a, a tough game. I mean, they have – their loss, I think, is the most excusable because Alabama's probably right up there with them. And so It's just hard to find 4-1 seeds. Who, who are your 4-1 seeds right now? Well, you want to say Purdue, right? But I would say, I would say Purdue's a 1 seed. Yeah, and that's probably another team that, that's closer to great, but only because of their first option. He's just so mm-hmm. – he has – there's such a gap – between him and the rest of the country in terms of first options. Like, he's the player of the year. And so, um, past him, are they a great team? That's that's the question, right? Is Kansas right? a great team? I don't think so. They got two losses. I don't know. They they People people had There's not number that. one a week ago, yeah. but... I, I just don't... I look... I watch them on, you know, watch them on the court. My eye test tells me this is not a great team. I think they're a really good team that can be a great team come March, but I don't think they're a great team right now. Yeah, I'm not sure no one is. I mean, obviously that's why we're having. This it's a weird year. It is a weird year. There's not. You look around. There's not a ton of like lottery picks. I mean, I think part of you know the, you look at the NBA draft next year and and it's you know why though. Well, you know, you know why. But I'm just saying, like, there's not there's not Zion's and Bancaros floating around college basketball this year. Yeah, and um, that's, that's in part because the, the, I know what you're getting at. The world is evolving and. Um, dudes are finding other avenues because they just don't want to sit in the classroom. I mean, who does, right? right? I don't. I didn't want to get this degree, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So you're, you're right. I mean, the, I think the best college prospect right now is like Cam Whitmore, and he's playing on a team nobody cares about now, and um, it's just not. A That's great part of it too, right? If the top guys, if they funnel to the top programs, it feels like there's more talent. Yeah. Than there is, and this is a year when. Duke is going through uh, a Ken- changing period. And Kentucky's Kentucky is struggling, really bad. Carolina's the disappointment. <sighs> um, you know, Indiana's not what we thought they were going to be. Um, I didn't. I was suspicious of Indiana all along, but yeah. but my point is like the the blue bloods are Gonzaga struggled early. Um, the blue bloods didn't necessarily perform yeah. at, at least in the first half of the season. I think that. That affects the perception of college basketball. No doubt. And and so you look at the landscape, and um, I wonder, does this make for – this has to make for a better tournament, right? Or does it make for a worse tournament? Well, it depends. I think for junkies like us, it's probably a better tournament. Um, for people who are just turning it, tuning in in March and want to see Kentucky and Duke, I think it's probably a worse tournament. Yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, I think there's legitimately – People don't want to see New Mexico? I think you could make an argument, Joel, that there's 10 to 15 teams who could win a national championship. Uh, which and is nasty. Which so is nasty. nasty yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say it's certainly more than most years. I want to clarify one point on the Nebraska NIT March. There are six home games the rest of the way. Uh, I think we, we omitted one. It's Northwestern, Penn State, Wisconsin, Maryland, Minnesota, Michigan State. I read all those. I know, but I said four and one, right, right. and they, I think they need to be five and one. So, interesting. Uh, go five and one. That makes it tougher. Steal one in uh, steal one in the Big Ten tournament, and uh, they'll be in the conversation. Easier said than done. Uh, question number four. 
I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, Joel, but I want you to answer the question legitimately. Okay. There's been a lot of discussion locally about the the strength of schedule for Nebraska and Creighton men's basketball, and I'm sure you could find it there on Ken Palm, mm-hmm. who's who's currently ranked higher. Who finishes of those two programs? Who finishes with the tougher strength of schedule? I think uh, I think it's interesting because I think the floor of the Big Ten is way higher than the floor of. Um, that's not a, that's not a nice thing to say about Georgetown. Well, Georgetown has to give <laughs> us nice things to say about them. Um, and DePaul, you know what's crazy? DePaul, I like to say, is not miles ahead of Minnesota, but it's a good distance ahead of Minnesota, especially after last night. Minnesota, and you give them 20 opportunities. I don't think they beat Xavier <laughs> once. And so um, it's just levels to the bottom of the conference. Georgetown is, like, historically bad for a P5 school, man. And so the fact that Creighton has to play them twice still um, doesn't, you know, benefit the strength of schedule thing if you want to use it for an argument and and pump your fish. Now keep in mind, this silly strength of schedule formula still takes into account all the non-con games, you know, so what happens to, uh, you know, St. Thomas University and schools like that. Yeah. Uh, But but I, I think chances are Nebraska finishes with a higher strength of schedule. You think so? I do. I th- well, I think Creighton still has the whole top of the Big East to play um, once Nebraska's more. done with Purdue. Yeah. I'll give you that. You got you, you got UConn, Marquette, um, Providence. Xavier, and Providence, who are all like top 20, 25. They each played them once more. And th- I think the top of the Big East is better than the top of the Big Ten, at least with the teams that are left to play for Nebraska because, like you said, Purdue's out the way. Nebraska has a whole bunch of just middle-of-the-road teams. I yeah. mean, it's Penn State, Northwestern, Maryland twice, um, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan. Rutgers looks good. But, Joel, this is nuts. But Nebraska has one, two, three, five. This is 12 games, twelve league games left. They only have one against a ranked opponent, and it's Rutgers. You know, the Big Ten is just a lot of – it's a lot of six through ten seeds right now in the NCAA yeah. tournament. They call it uh, cannibalism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that isn't where I thought you were going to go with that. But <laughs> now, now here's the real reason I asked the question. I am really, really weary of the excuses and the I narrative know, about know. schedule strength and the beating our chest because we played such good teams in the non-con. Just shut up. Just go <laughs> play basketball, all right? Yeah. Like, nobody wants to hear about how, oh, we scheduled too tough or we, you know, Nebraska played one too many games against a Power Five and K-State was better than we thought they were going to be or Creighton played too many games, you know, without a bye game. You know, they, they shouldn't have gone to Vegas or they shouldn't have gone to Texas. Just shut up, okay? <laughs> Just play basketball, there, it's a long season. Everybody has easy games. Everybody has cream puffs. Um, I'm so tired of the excuse making on, on frankly, both sides, more so on Creighton, uh, about <laughs> about this schedule stuff. Like you were supposed to be a top ten team. There's a reason they scheduled aggressively. Um, play the play the team in front of you. I don't want to hear about oh we we had to play two power five opponents. You know in a in a four day span. Shut up. Just play, all right? Well, and, and and Creighton should have been good enough to handle that. This is my thing. I think you and I are two of the few. You could probably count on both hands, um, maybe. This is probably just a brass thought. But you could count on, probably on both hands of people who actually held Creighton to the standard that we held them going into the season. People people around here act like they, like want, they weren't They wanted to be- it both ways. Joel, they wanted it both ways. They wanted to think of Creighton as a Final Four contender, and yet they didn't think Creighton was good enough to play Arizona State and BYU in a 48-hour span. And like that and That's the heart of the problem, right? It's yeah. like if you're freaking Duke or Gonzaga, or Gonzaga, you play those games and you celebrate it. Uh, if you lose them, you don't make an excuse about playing them in the first place. And this is the problem with the some of the some of the people I've saw that have received my my work or some of the things I've written about Creighton in, in recent weeks or like back at that time, and they they received it poorly. Like, dude, like I, I 
I felt like I I started to feel like I was one of the only people who actually thought Creighton was capable of being a top 10, 15 team until they lose these games and they're like, why are you talking about Creighton like that? And it's like, dog, am I the only one that thought that you were supposed to hold up their <laughs> ranking? Like, what the, like, bro. And so um, it's created this weird narrative and um, obviously people bring up, I think some of the, the strength of schedule stuff is fair because we're not talking about like they got top 20 strength of schedule. Like we're talking about top three here in the country. So it, it's, it's definitely fair. And a lot of it, I had to look back at it and think like a lot of the stuff was out of their control. Like uh, Texas, uh, was the the Big Twelve challenge? Uh, Maui was playing years ago. Um, Nebraska happens to the, happens to be your thing, but that's not a game they should have lost anyway. Um, BYU it just came with unfortunate circumstances because of of Hulk if Brenner. Hulk Brenner plays, yeah, right, there's right, right. no complaints. You're right, you're right, you're right. Like he didn't th- look he didn't look good against Arizona. People they got beat. He, yes. he he didn't look good for three weeks, and they lost a bunch of games, and some of it was the fault of him being off, and some of it was the fault of everybody else playing like crap. But play the game. Like, these guys, they play 80 games a year growing up yeah. in, in the AAU circuit. They play a great team every time they go out, and now they can't handle BYU and Arizona State in a 48-hour span? I think, I think the thing was... Come on! Like... I think if they never lose to Nebraska, we look at the season differently. And I think if they somehow won Maui and then lost Vegas, people would be cutting them some slack. But it's the fact that they already rolled into that with losses against Texas, losses against you know Arizona, when people maybe did for a little brief second hold them to the standard yeah. that I did. And so now I, I think um, – I think, like, even when I was writing about them and writing what I saw and that they were losing and they, they had flaws, which they still, their v- flaws are very visible. They've just found ways to work around them, I think, in recent weeks. Um, people have come around to that. But when when they were dropping games left and right, it was just such a letdown, I think, from what they hoped for. Um, they had to find an excuse. Sure. And you know what? Nebraska's situation, I think, is more damaging, the schedule thing, because if they don't... It was just a really bad year to do that. If they don't yeah. play... Let's say they don't play K-State, okay? Let's say they play a, a gimme. That has, a, like, a direct effect on your ability to get to the postseason. Like, because that's swapping out, very directly swapping out a loss for a win. And they might end up one or two wins short uh, of the postseason at when this is all said and done. So yeah. I think the Creighton stuff gets most of the attention because they lost six games in a row. But I think the, the Nebraska scheduling situation uh, might end up being more regrettable just because I think they might come up one or two short of making the NIT. Yeah. And, and we kind of talked about this leading up to the season. Like This was supposed to be the year where they scheduled like all the cupcake games because this was the year you, you wanted to – maybe give Hoiberg an extra year or save his job for a year. And so um, it makes it all the more confusing now that um, it's people just, are using it yeah, as an argument. It's harder to do that than it used to be. I mean, it's, you know, when you're playing conference games in December, I mean, you used to be able to run up 11-2 and two in the non-con easily. Like when I was, you know, starting out, I mean, it's it was very common to see teams that, that played – almost nobody in the non-con. Yeah. Well, now, because you play more conference games, um, you know, Creighton and Nebraska are both playing 20, and because you're playing some of those league games in December, um, and because you've got, you know, contracts with Big Ten ACC Challenge and, you know, tournaments that almost everybody plays in a tournament somewhere, yeah. it's just harder to run up a really good non-con record. And, yeah. and Nebraska, I think, ordinarily would have tried to do that. It just... It didn't work out for him. So. Yeah. And it makes for good basketball, but maybe skewed perception of reality. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like When you argue for your team to play an easier schedule, you're, you're arguing to see less interesting basketball, and I always have a hard time with that. Yeah, and so I, th- I, think, and I think from, from both teams, we've, we saw that their, their schedules have challenged them to maybe get a few wins that they needed, and uh, that, that should be the goal behind every – team that schedules um as, as tough as them but yep. at the same time i think it is kind of weird to to argue strength of schedule with that being said 
Shall we? Um, fifth and final question, Joel. What in the heck do we do about college basketball officiating? Because it feels like this thing is has been under a microscope for many years. Everybody always complains about it. I get it. But the Big Ten especially, I know we pay more attention there than most leagues, but, but it just feels like there's more scrutiny, there's more complaints, there's more low lights of officiating mistakes. Uh, Joel, is this just inevitable in the replay age uh, when every game's on TV and we're studying things so closely, or there is there a real issue here that can be improved? I'm not sure you can just improve the human brain. Yeah. These are still humans, right? We're not, we not hiring androids and dressing them up in the, in the black and white, like... Um, these are humans with with um, with faults and and processing and um, sometimes faulty processing and so. Um, but you've noticed it, right? Yeah, and and me personally, I hate pointing out officiating, man. Yeah, I, I hate Same. I hate dwelling on officiating because I think um, it already takes away so much from the game. Like being one of those reporters or even just a basketball viewer in general that dwells on on officiating like dude you should be able to have takeaways from the game without paying attention to the whistle like i was i was pretty pissed i think during that uh what game was that it might have been the providence game um where dudes were just in foul trouble and i had to like for what felt the first time all season because i purposely take myself out of paying attention to officiating like that i kept having to track whistles and really locking on officiating and it pissed me off because I don't want to be a whistle tracker man it's annoying and people have called for the Big East to do something because you listen to Big East viewers and they think that's the worst officiated uh, power league in, in the country so um, it's just like we're at like an all time low for officiating for some reason I don't know I don't it, know if for, we a new crop. We, like, yeah, we should point out that it's it's a really really hard job I mean you yeah. could literally call foul on every play in college basketball, you could, and and what's a what's a moving screen one time down the court is not a moving screen the next time down the court. Uh, the verticality thing at the rim drives me crazy. I think they allow way too much contact at the rim. I mean, it's just you could literally call something every single possession, yeah. and officials know they shouldn't do that, so they pick and choose. But the problem is when you pick and choose, you know, you're sort of you're creating almost a, an arbitrary system where something is a foul on one possession and it's not a foul on the next possession. And I think it's just kind of driving people crazy right now. And it, and it, some of it is, you know, we've had a lot of end of, ga- end of game situations. Um, some of it is when a narrative begins, Joel, when a narrative takes hold, then you're paying closer attention to that stuff, right? Yeah. Like Nebraska's had a, a couple really, you know, obvious situations here in the last few weeks where it's like, what in the hell was that called? That was a critical moment in the game and it shouldn't have been called. Yeah. Uh, and like, like we opened the show with the foul on Tominaga last night, that easily could have cost Nebraska the game. I mean, they should have called the travel before the, before the foul. Uh, you know, the CJ Wiltshire play a few, a few weeks ago where he was whistled for a foul. There's just a lot of moments where you're like, you know, it feels like a call is often deciding a game and that's, that's what you don't want. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think like a, a a play like the the Tominaga play last night, like that's an isolated incident where it's like, yeah, this is a faulty crew. They made a bad call. Um, but I think just to pick up officiating in general in one fell swoop, um, we have to maybe look away from crews and, and whatnot and not look at the people officiating and just take away certain calls. Like I think uh, like verticality is one like we have to step away from and, and – um, like that's one that should be really honed in on because it's one of the more annoying calls. Um, the block charge, which is obviously <laughs> we, have, been, we haven't even talked block charge. Yeah, with the block charge was obviously probably the most controversial in, in basketball history. Maybe we need to look about uh, look at uh, eradicating it entirely because I've seen people argue that, and you know I'm I'm usually like I usually didn't care before because I hate talking about officiating. But maybe it's that time. And well, calls like that, I think you could just either key in on or take away entirely to yeah. just change the game in in one instant. It would be really interesting to have sort of a, a creative, fresh conversation about officiate not just officiating, but just 
how you want to incentivize offense. Um, because it's my opinion, Joel, that that one reason we see so many three point shots is because it's become ridiculously hard to get to the basket or for post players to score at the basket. You know, th- there's just so much contact that's allowed around the rim that it forces players to take 25 foot step backs um, in order to generate offense. And and I would like to see, you know, a greater incentive to to get to the rim. Um, you know, you think we're more physical now than back then. Well, I don't know what back then means. Like the nineties and, and if so you on. go to if you look at a game in nineteen ninety five in college basketball, I think it I think around the rim it's more physical now. Um really? if you look at it ten years ago, I think it was more probably more physical then. But post players are just getting hammered, like all the time. It's it's really hard to score on the block. And basketball wasn't really designed that way back in the day. You know, like you were supposed to try to get the ball closer to the rim to shoot it. And defenses generally didn't hammer away at guys or they'd get called for a foul. I mean, go, go watch a game, Joel, in 1991 and, and look at how much c- contact is called around the rim uh, that's not called now. So I realize we're all sort of – we have this narrative in our head that it was, you know, the bad boys and Charles Oakley hammering away at guys, but, but – it's really physical at the rim right now. And I think a lot of it is because of this verticality thing where officials just let defenders, <laughs> you know, hammer away at a guy when he's in midair around attacking the basket. Uh, I, and, and so thus, I think the most efficient way to score is to shoot a 25-foot jump shot. I don't know if that's why guys are shooting jumpers. I mean, the game has changed. Obviously, uh, guys like Steph and Dame and whoever else uh, fostered that that love for chucking up shots because they – they see people could do it, and uh, the range has extended. I don't, I don't know if it's because of the for the Cali at the rim. Like you see, real athletes that got the potential to finish at the rim don't shy away from the rim. Like if if a Shaden Sharp would have played last year for Kentucky, there was no shying away from the rim for, for that guy. Like the guys who know they're capable at the rim, I think they still go to the rim. I think the the three point, um, you know, it's a factor. I'm not saying it's sure. a it's a direct sure. cause. Uh, you know, but but it is a factor. I think there's a reason that post guys don't score anymore. There's a reason you don't post up your best player. When it's when also not sexy anymore. When it's Ryan Kalkbrenner scores twenty, it's because sixteen of them come on alley oops. It's not because they're dumping it to him, you know, and he's going. I mean, Jokic did it. You know, he does it. I watched him last night, and he's he's different. Everything he's inside different. Five feet goes in. It's. It's just sexier it's like to be a roll it. man than it is to pound the basketball and and put your butt on somebody and and you know slow the game down so much to like nobody wants to play like yeah. that anymore. Well, and, and you know you mentioned block charge. I I think it's sort of a when in doubt, it's a charge world that we live in, and I would so much prefer if it was a when in doubt, it's a block world. I mean it's. I feel like the the ratio, which is probably seventy thirty charge or sixty forty charge, I would love to see that flipped around. And and officials now they just fall back on the charge circle, and it's like if the guy's outside the circle, it doesn't matter whether he was moving or not. If he's inside the circle, it doesn't matter whether he's moving or not. Well, so. the worst one, and this is why some of these dudes should should get the guillotine. <laughs> the worst one is when you're inside the circle, and they still call it. Uh, a charge. a charge, like Jesus Christ, man, it's ridiculous. I well, mean, it's, unfortunately, they're watching their feet instead of watching, you know, whether they're actually there in time. Uh, I watched a guy, you know, Kansas. Dewan Harris goes up the other night against K State, and a K State guy's trying to draw a charge, and his shoulder clips his foot, and Harris lands on his face. It's just like, yeah. what have we incentivized defenders to do? Like this is just uh, nasty I w- stuff. And you know, the other part of it, <clears throat> I would love to see. Um, I would love to see that foul, if it is called a charge, I would love to see that foul become a turnover and not a personal foul. Hmm. Because for, for, for great players to lose a foul or two on a, on a 50-50 ref's discretion, yeah, um, I, agree. I think that should just be a turnover and it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a per- personal foul. I agree. All right, Joe. Well, we covered a lot of ground. There will be lots more to cover next time. Uh, we sure appreciate our audience. Uh, 
we realize it's uh, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff going on every night in college basketball. We obviously cover the the Huskers and the Jays closest, but we try to look at everything in addition to that. And uh, we appreciate you. So uh, he's Joel. I'm Dirk. We'll catch you next time on the Half Court Press podcast. <laughs>